Uh, well, on behalf of MITAC, the MIT Activities Committee, I want to welcome you today to the Sloths, Rhinos, Tigers, and Lions talk today with um, Dr. Samantha uh, Rusick from Southwick Zoo, who's going to show us some of the very interesting and fun um, animals that are at the zoo and uh, some of their sleeping habits and eating habits and, and everything else in between. So, um, Samantha, thank you so much for joining us again and um, let us learn about all these fun, fun creatures there at, at Southwick Zoo. Thank you so much for having me on again. Um, hopefully, you guys will be learning something fun and new and interesting today about some of the favorite animals here. Um, so, my name is Samantha. I am the Director of Education here at Southwick Zoo. Uh, we also have a nonprofit called Earth Limited based here at the zoo. Um, so I work very closely with them as well for all of our educational and conservation projects. And um, so I'm really excited to talk about some of the visitors' favorite animals, some of my favorite animals today. So we're going to be learning all about sloths, um, lions and tigers, and our rhinos. And so we'll just jump right in. So we have lots to go over today. And there we go. Um, so we're going to talk about sloths first. Um, and most of the pictures, most if not all of the pictures you'll see are of our actual animals here at Southwick Zoo. Um, so this is one of our two-toed sloths. So for anyone interested in the taxonomy, you can see um, that they are definitely mammals and they're part of the suborder folivora. Excuse me. So folivores are animals that eat leaves. Um, sloths are definitely known for eating their leaves. We'll talk about their diet in a little bit. Um, there are two species of two-toed sloths, um, but there are also animals called three-toed sloths, and the family um, or the suborder that they're part of also included all of the extinct ground sloths, which sound really fascinating. Uh, if they were still around, these were like giant animals. It's hard to imagine a sloth that big. Um, compared to the three-toed sloths, uh, two-toads tend to be a little bit larger. And they have longer hair and um, longer arms. Um, other than that, they look very similar. What's interesting is that the two families of sloths actually diverged over 40 million years ago. Um, so they're as closely related to each other as people are to capuchin monkeys or a monkey of a similar size. Uh, so even though they look very similar, um, they are a good example of convergent evolution, um, where they did have a common ancestor millions of years ago and just kept those same traits um, that were being selected for in their environments. Um, a little side note about their taxonomy, uh, if we throw in a super order in there, they can be part of the super order Xenarthra, which I think is just a really fun name to say. Um, but this super order includes animals like armadillos and uh, anteaters. Um, so originally, you might have heard of the term edentate. Um, and this is a group of animals that were called this because edentate means no teeth. Um, and we'll find out that these animals do actually have some teeth, um, but the trait that they all share in common is that they lack true incisors. And so that's why um, they're put together into this super order. Uh, back to our sloths. So I mentioned that they're called two-toed sloths. Now there's some controversy recently over whether they should be called two-toed or two-fingered. So if we zoom in on our friend's hands and feet here, um, you can see that the two limbs closest to the right side of the screen actually have two digits or two claws on each of them. And then the uh, closer to the left, you'll see that that foot has three digits or three claws. So both two-toed and three-toed sloths are actually kind of misnamed because they both have three toes. Uh, the difference lies in the digits on their front limbs. And so um, it has been uh, put out there that we should really be calling two-toed sloths two-fingered sloths. Um, some researchers and scientists have adapted that new name into their uh, publications, but it hasn't been officially recognized yet. All right, so um, when it comes to other interesting features about sloths, um, they're kind of medium-sized mammals. They're between nine to 18 pounds and about two feet long. Um, in the wild, 
it's not a lot of information is known about sloths. We're still constantly learning about them. They're very kind of secretive creatures, um, but we, at this point, understand their lifespan to be about 15 years in the wild. They can live a lot longer if they're under human care, so 40 to 50 years. Um, and that's because, unfortunately, sloths have a very high mortality rate in the wild um, due to a lot of human wildlife conflicts. So getting electrocuted on power lines, getting hit by cars, um, things like that. We'll talk a little bit more about those conservation-related issues in a little bit. Um, and I thought I saw a chat pop up here. Oh, I was just reminding everyone, if you have questions, we'll kind of pause at the end of this section here. Um, so really other interesting thing about sloths is that they have a different number of cervical or neck vertebrae, neck bones, than most other mammals. So almost all other mammals, whether they're a small little rodent um, or a huge elephant, have seven neck vertebrae. There are a few animals that are the exception to that rule. Two-toed sloths are one of them. So they only have five vertebrae. Three-toed sloths have nine. And then the other mammal that breaks that rule is a manatee, which also has five vertebrae. And it's believed that this is an adaptation that allows them to move their head more freely to look around in different directions without moving the rest of their body, which saves them energy, uh, which we're gonna talk about in a second is a really important thing for sloths. All right. Um, a little bit more about their hair. Uh, which is kind of unique for mammals as well. Their hair actually grows in the opposite direction from what you'd expect for most mammals. Um, so their hair actually parts in the middle of their abdomen and this goes along with them spending almost the entirety of their time and lives upside down. But their hair is specially adapted to facilitate growth of algae and, and fun fungi. Um, so each of their hair has a unique groove running down the center, which traps moisture, which promotes the growth of these symbiotic organisms. And it's believed that the algae in their fur help them camouflage. Um, they also attract uh, moths and beetles and other invertebrates in their fur. And so they kind of are carrying around a mini ecosystem with them, which is a really cool, a little weird thing to think about, um, but very fascinating. So the invertebrates that they carry around don't seem to harm the sloth at all. Um, they lay their eggs, usually in sloth feces. They may feed on the algae that's in the fur, um, but otherwise they really leave the sloth alone and the sloths seem unbothered. Now this is something that's very common for sloths in the wild. Um, usually sloths in human care in zoos don't have these hosts or aren't host to these types of organisms. Um, the temperature conditions are different, the humidity conditions are different, so the sloths here at the zoo don't have any algae or fungal growths or there might be a, you know, a beetle or moth or something that finds its way into their fur every now and then uh, when they're outside, but they don't have these large colonies that you might expect in the wild sloths. Um, I mentioned we're going to talk about their behavior, which is fairly unique. So um, sloths are different from most other mammals. Um, even though they are a mammal, which means they are an endotherm, which means they can regulate their own body temperature, they're more sensitive to temperatures outside compared to most other mammals because they have the lowest and also the most variable body temperature of all mammals. Um, and they actually have a very low muscle mass relative to their body weight compared to mammals. And that makes it harder for them to actually regulate their temperature like other mammals do. So they're very sensitive to the cold um, and even more so because they can't shiver because they lack that muscle mass. Um, going along with that variable body temperature and low muscle mass, they have a very slow metabolism as well. Uh, so again, they're moving very slowly through the trees. They're the slowest moving mammals that we have. They sleep 15 to 20 hours a day. Again, that relates to that slow metabolism. Um, we'll talk about their diet in just a second, which is all leaves. Um, so that is adding to the, just they're very slow. They have a slow metabolism. And between that, they only go to the bathroom about once a week. Um, they'll do this by descending from the trees and going to the ground. So they put themselves in a very vulnerable position. But what's interesting is because they only go to the bathroom once a week, um, they can deposit feces and urine that can account for up to 30% of their body weight. Um, so every week they can lose up to 30% of their weight 
um, at a time, which is kind of an amazing thing to think about. Um, in addition to being just very slow, uh, we also know that they're arboreal, so they spend most of their time in their trees. They are generally solitary, so you're really only going to see female sloths with their offspring together, otherwise they would be on their own. And they're generally sleeping during the day and up at night, so they're considered nocturnal. A really interesting thing that we wouldn't really associate with sloths normally is that they're excellent, excellent swimmers. Um, so they are, again, in a vulnerable position when they're in the water, they might fall prey to a large anaconda. Um, but they are good swimmers, which allows them to cross rivers and streams in their wild habitats, um, which are rainforests, which we will talk about right now. So um, both two-toed and three-toed sloth, three sloths, sorry, tongue twister there, are found in rainforests of Central and South America. Um, so this is a really colorful map that shows the overlap between those species. So there are um, areas where two-toed and three-toed sloths overlap. Um, all of the sloths that start with the B, the Bradypus, are the three-toed sloths, and the Calepis are the two-toed sloths. Um, so you can see they're mostly up in the Central America and Northern South America, and then along this coast here. Um, but there is some overlap there. Right. Now when it comes to what they're eating, um, they are considered folivores, which again is how that order gets their name, folivora. So that means in their native habitats in the wild, they're eating things like leaves, buds, flowers, and fruits. Here at the zoo, uh, we try and give our sloth a variety of different types of plant and fruits and veg vegetables to make sure they're getting the nutrition that they need. Um, and we're constantly changing that diet um, to kind of modify their needs based on how they're acting, uh, what their feces look like to make sure they're staying healthy. So here they get a combination of corn, sweet potato, um, pre-made biscuits that are called leaf eater biscuits and browse biscuits. These are made for animals in human care that have a more leaf-based diet out in the wild. Um, things like zucchini, lettuce, pepper, apple, and pear. Um, so they definitely get a variety. Our sloths definitely have their favorites. Uh, most of them really love their corn and sweet potatoes. We do have to be careful with those two items in particular though because they're a little bit high in sugar. Um, so this next slide is actually um, a little video of a few of our sloths eating. So hopefully it'll play. So this is one of our younger sloths, Perry, grabbing a piece of sweet potato. You can see those nice two fingers there. Um, and you can also see their teeth. We'll get another view. This is our older female, Jenny, and her newest little one, Ficus. And you can see even out a few months old, he's already starting to learn how to eat solid food, but he's still hanging on to mom. Um, and the camera's gonna pan around uh, in a second to show the other side of Jenny. We'll get a nice view of her teeth. Now I mentioned that um, they are part of the group of animals that lack true incisors but you will see that they have a very sharp canine looking tooth. Um, so it's not a true canine, it's called a pseudo canine, but it's very sharp and triangular in shape and it does the job, there you go, you can see the nice view there, of breaking down those tough fibrous plant foods. And also could give you a good, good injury if you accidentally get your finger in there. So even though they're slow and sweet looking, we do have to be careful where our fingers are going, especially um, when we get close to them during feeding time. Now, as I mentioned, they have a very slow metabolism, so any food that they're eating uh, can take up to a month to digest. And again, they're only going to go um, to the bathroom about once a week. All right. So um, to give you a, a little bit of a better idea of our particular sloths that we have here at Southwix, uh, we currently have four sloths. So we have um, our adult male, we call him Papa Sloth, and he was born in 2005, so he's about 15 years old. So remember, that's right at that maximum age for wild sloths, but we expect him to be around with us for a lot longer um, since we're giving him care and he doesn't have to worry about predators or finding food or any of those hardships out in the wild. Our adult female, as I mentioned, is Jenny. She was also born in 2005. Um, and she's had a number, number of offspring since she's been here. Um, we do have two of her offspring right now. Um, the littlest one, which we'll see in a second, is still with her. 
and Perry is an older offspring. Um, in the wild, sloths, because they're solitary, so once they uh, reach sexual maturity at a few years of age, they would go off and find their own territory. So obviously here at the zoo, um, they don't have access to a wide expanse of rainforest to move off. So we work with other facilities and uh, work with them to trade or um, move around sloths in captive populations so that we can make sure genetic lines are being spread out appropriately and give them their own new territory and a new place to settle down in. Um, so Perry is the older offspring that's still here. Um, he was born in 2017, and so he's a few years old, and we've worked with him extensively since day one. So um, we kept an eye on him for a few weeks, and when we felt that he was comfortable and mom was comfortable, um, we actually spent a little bit of time each day taking him off mom and socializing him so that he would be better used to people um, so that he could be a good ambassador animal. So we do give uh, keeper talks here and we work with our animals here um, to show off their natural behavior and encourage those behaviors for people to learn about. And we'll see a, a video of him doing some of those behaviors in just a second. And then finally, our newest little one, Ficus, was just born this past February. So he is still on mom most of the time. He is just starting to explore off of mom on his own. Um, so he's hitting all the milestones we expect to be hitting, starting to eat that solid food, starting to move around on his own. Um, and we'll see how he goes. Usually they can stay up with mom for a little bit over a year. Um, and then we'll have to start looking for a new enclosure here at the zoo or at another facility for him. All right. Um, okay, so a little note about husbandry or how we actually take care of the sloths here. Now I mentioned that they were very sensitive to temperature. So they are on exhibit only seasonally, which means that when we're open, um, and the weather is nice, usually from about May through almost right about now, we have to keep an eye on the weather getting colder. They can be outside on the exhibit. We have a heaters in their enclosures for the cooler nights. Um, but once it gets cold, we move them inside permanently. So we really need to keep a close eye on that outside temperature. Um, our sloths, whether they're inside or outside, their enclosures get cleaned every day. Um, when they're inside, they get fed once a day, when they're outside, they get fed twice a day. Um, and this is mainly not because of the way that sloths eat, but because of the way the native animals here will steal their food. Um, so because they're very slow eaters, they sort of pick up their food all day, um, usually are more active at night, so they might wait until the end of the day to actually wake up and eat their food. And we have lots of chipmunks around here that love to take advantage of the outdoor enclosures. Um, so we feed them twice a day to make sure that the food is actually going to the sloths and not to the chipmunks instead. Um, I've mentioned in previous talks, and, and you'll hear me say this a couple times throughout today's talk, that uh, we really pride ourselves on giving enrichment to all of our animals. So enrichment is something we provide the animals um, that stimulates natural behaviors and sort of prevents them from um, being bored or doing those stereotypic behaviors that we don't want to see. We want to make sure that their brains are being stimulated and that they stay healthy. Um, so in the picture here, you'll see that's just a PVC pipe with holes that were drilled in it so we can stick the food in it. And it's not a perfect, um, you know, one-to-one -one comparison with leaves on branches, but it arranges the food in a way that they have to reach out and grab it and manipulate it. Um, so that the food is not just sitting there in a pile in front of them. So they have to work a little bit for that food and use their brains a little bit to figure out how to get those pieces out of the PVC pipe. Um, things like branches, ropes, fire hose um, are also really common forms of enrichment for them, anything that they can climb um, because that's where they spend most of their time. We also do training with our animals here, um, which has a number of purposes. Um, so it helps us when we're cleaning the animals and moving around them, um, as for the sloths especially because we move them in and out. Uh, we've worked extensively on crate training. So instead of having a stressful experience for both the zookeepers and the animals of having to grab an animal and move them inside, um, we set up the situation so that the sloths or the animals are actually willing to go into the crates all on their own in a very stressful free environment. And so we'll see a video clip of that in just a second. Um, so this first video is a quick time lapse that one of our zookeepers took. 
Um, this was when Jenny and Papa Sloth were out on an, an exhibit together. So this was pre-Ficus. Um, once Ficus was born, we did separate Jenny from our male. Um, our male here, Papa Sloth, is very good. He doesn't ever seem to bother the babies. Um, but Jenny definitely seems to feel more comfortable on her own when she has a baby away from the other sloths. Um, again, this is what would be more natural for them in the wild to do. So we definitely help her out by keeping her more calm um, by putting her in a different enclosure from Papa. But this was back in August of last year when they were together. And you'll see our zookeeper, Diana, working at top speed thanks to the time lapse. So she just handed them a piece of corn each to give them a little snack. You can see her taking down old enrichment, putting up new enrichment, placing food around the exhibit, um, and then cleaning, and then a final wave goodbye. All right. Um, this video here is one of those training sessions. So this is also Diana. This is Perry, who I mentioned we've worked with from day one. And so what she is doing is holding her hand out and seeing the word target. And Perry gets a treat or a piece of food when he hits that target or goes to that target of her hand um, with his nose. And so this is a really useful behavior. Target training gets an animal where we need them to go. It's useful for vet examinations, moving an animal, um, transportation from one enclosure to another, um, and just positioning the animal in ways we can do a better examination if we need to know about something that's going on. And then finally, this is a little clip of crate training with Perry. Um, so again, you can see that he voluntarily comes right out of that crate onto a rope perch. Um, and this is when we move him from his outdoor enclosure to his indoor enclosure. And that's why you're seeing some of the, the wire there. But you can see it's a very stress-free, he's moving at a nice slow pace. Um, his hair is all, down the way we want it. He doesn't look scared or frightened or stressed in any way. And that's, those are the behaviors that we're looking for with these animals. All right, so um, the last thing I wanna talk about with sloths is that as cute as they are to just watch and have here, um, we really make an effort here at Southwood Zoo and with our nonprofit Earth Limited um, to make sure people are learning about the animals, that they have an educational experience, and to really let people know that the animals that are here as ambassadors to bring awareness for their wild counterparts. Um, a lot of the animals we have here at the zoo are endangered in the wild, and so they need our help. Um, so sloths are actually not considered endangered um, in terms of being officially classified by government agencies but their populations are decreasing. And so I mentioned that they're at risk from electrocution, from power lines. They get attacked by feral dogs or even domestic dogs that are pets. Um, they get run over by cars as more roadways are being put in their habitat um, and just general habitat loss. Also because they're slow, so slow moving, a lot of people capture sloths and think they can keep them as pets. Um, as you can see, they don't have a very um, easy diet to replicate, and they are very sensitive to temperature. So usually people that have these sloths um, in their homes as pets uh, don't really know how to take care of them properly. So we do have daily keeper talks about our sloths here at the zoo. Um, while they're on exhibit, uh, people can learn about what we feed them, how we take care of them, um, where they live in the wild. Um, and then we also do in the season when it's warmer out, uh, we do sloth encounters. And so these encounters are offered um, to paid participants who can come in and actually get a little bit closer to our sloths and feed them some of their diet for the day. Um, and the money from those encounters go towards funding the Sloth Institute in Costa Rica. Um, and they're a really important organization because they're, they're in Costa Rica helping to rehabilitate injured sloths um, and also raise uh, awareness in the community about how to care and conserve for sloths there. Um, so that's kind of the end of the sloth section. I saw something pop up in the chat window here. Yeah, so we have one person asking where do sloths usually come from, which region in the world, so maybe if you could go back to the slide with that map for them real okay. quick. All right, yep, let me see here. 
go past all those cute videos that I could watch day, day in and day out. All right, there we go. All right, so um, this is our, our map. So um, as you can see here, we have, um, we're looking for the two toad sloths or the two here on the right hand side. Um, so we're looking for the lighter and darker purple area and then the yellow and the blue. Um, so the blue is really hard to see, you almost don't see it at all, but this purple that starts in Central America and goes to the top part of South America. Um, and then this part here as well. And they're definitely found in more tropical, moist, humid rainforest areas. So they don't like where it's dry. They like it to be nice and wet and humid for sure. And, and then, then, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> uh, Sorry, Dami, you cut you off if you're still still going on this question. Nope, I'm all set. <laughs> all right. Uh, they're also asking if female sloths can only give birth to one sloth and how easily do they get pregnant? Yeah, good question. Um, so as far as I know, um, they only have one sloth at a time. I'm not aware of any instances of um, multiple births, um, twins or triplets even. Um, because they are very uh, slow energy-wise and metabolism-wise, it takes a lot of energy um, to put into a pregnancy and to raising young. So they're really only made to have one young um, at a time. Their gestation is about 11 and a half months. So it's a pretty long pregnancy. Um, and that baby is usually about 500 grams, so um, less than a pound. Um, and the baby though has is is born with eyes open, little tiny sharp teeth, <laughs> um, and just instinctual climbs on. So you can see in this picture here with Lauren, um, this is when Ficus was a little bit younger, that they spend about the first six months, five to six months, on the mother's stomach. Um, and so probably that's the only part of their entire lifetime that they are gonna spend not upside down. Um, once they reach about six months, they're going to start going off on their own and learn how to hang and move around upside down. Um, so it's really incredible, um, you know, the amount of work and energy. And what's interesting is that um, sloths as mammals do have nipples, just like every other mammal, but theirs is under their armpit. Um, so if you see a baby on a sloth and its head is kind of snuggled in that armpit, it's probably actually nursing or feeding at the moment, not just snuggling in there. Um, so, uh, and then as I mentioned, they usually stay with mom for about a year. Um, now in terms of how easily they get pregnant, um, I think it varies from individual to individual. Um, in the wild, it takes a lot more work for them to find each other because they are solitary. Um, I, they don't really have set breeding seasons as far as I know. It varies a little bit from one species to the next. Um, so it's a matter of those males finding those females. Um, but Jenny here has had, I'm trying to think, four successful um, offspring um, since I've, well, not since I've, she came here with a baby. So in the past 10 years, I'd say she's had at least four offspring that I know about. Um, so she has one about every one to two years and um, is a very good mom. So here uh, she's doing very well and it's easy for her to, to get pregnant and raise her children, which is great because then we have a healthy population in human care. We don't have to be getting spots from the wild for people to be able to see them here in the States. Excellent questions. Any other questions about our sloth friends? Uh, not at the moment, but if anyone has questions throughout you know, the next section of the talk, go ahead and drop them into the chat. All right, and we're good to go. All right, Thanks, all right. So we're gonna move on to our big cats. Um, specifically, we're gonna talk about on lions and tigers. Um, so when people say the word big cat, they're generally referring to members of the genus Panthera. So your tigers, lions, leopards, um, jaguars, and snow leopards. Now, one of the things that makes a big cat different from a small cat um, is not only that inclusion in that genus, but is the ability to roar. Um, so all of those big cats that I mentioned, except for the snow leopard, can roar. Um, and cats that can roar are those that cannot purr. Um, and cats that can purr 
are ones that don't pour. So you kind of have an either or situation going on there. Now, um, I'm gonna play this in just a second. It does have sound. This is our male, LJ Roaring. Um, their ability to roar comes from an elongated and specially adapted larynx and hyoid apparatus. Um, so they have the same general structures that we do in our throat, but theirs is very specially adapted to create this very loud sound. Um, the larynx vibrates and that's what produces the sound there. So um, the lion has the longest larynx out of all those cats, which means it has the loudest roar. Um, and their roar can be heard up to five miles away. So it is definitely loud, definitely gets the job done to make uh, all the animals in the area know that he is there and that his, is his territory. So um, I'm going to hopefully play this and you'll hear it. This is LJ roaring. Um, it's towards the end of his roar, so it kind of sounds like he's doing short little bursts. That is very typical as his roar trails off. Um, so you'll see it here. And if you look closely, this was taken on a cooler morning so you can see his breath in the air a little bit as well. All right, let's hope this. All right, I love that little grunt at the end, and that's very typical. So as you can see, um, we kind of caught it at the tail end. He's so hard to couch roaring. He does it like clockwork almost every day at the end of the day, but by the time he gets down there, he's already finished. He times it perfectly. If he sees a camera, he'll close his mouth. Um, so that was at the end where he kind of trails off, and you can see the little final grunts at the end. Um, but he's definitely grown into that roar. So um, he's been here since he's a has, was a cub. And so you, you can hear how he gets bigger in his vocal cords and the larynx grows inside along with him, how his roar gets deeper over time. It's really interesting to watch. Um, in terms of lion size, um, males are a little bit bigger than the females. Um, so generally we're talking about large cats. So they're gonna be 250 to 400 pounds. And typical of mammals this size, they live about 10 to 15 years. Um, now, we, most people know that males, uh, male lions are very distinctive because of their mane. So they're the only member of the cat family with an obvious sexual dimorphism, meaning females and males look different besides just being different in size. Um, males have those manes, which do start growing about one, uh, when they're about one year old. Now, all lions, males and females, have this little tail tuft at the base of their tail which starts developing at around five and a half months old. Um, we're not really sure the purpose of that tail tuft. There is a bony spur at the end of their tail um, but they don't really use it for anything. So scientists are not really sure why it's there um, but that tuft helps protect it um, there. Uh, there have been a couple of different theories about the manes in lions um, but it's generally agreed upon that darker colored manes tend to indicate healthier males. Um, so female lions tend to be more attracted to those um, darker maned male lions. Um, however, they don't often get a big choice um, because when it comes to living in groups, there's usually one male lion and then a pride, um, the rest of the pride is consistent of females. So they don't really get too much choice in, in who they're mating with. Um, but research has shown that usually healthier, more robust males have darker manes. Um, what's really interesting is that there are some male lions in a few areas of, in India that um, have been shown to not grow manes, and scientists think this is attributed they just have less testosterone in their systems. Um, increased testosterone in female lions have also caused some female lions to grow manes, um, and this has been reported in Botswana. So it's definitely tied to hormones, um, again, which is another indicator of, of um, genetic health. All right. um, when it comes to our tigers, they are 
similar in size. They can get a little bit bigger than the um, lines, especially the males. So again, males are bigger than females, um, but we're still talking about a pretty heavy cat um, and similar lifespan, 10 to 15 years. Uh, males are larger than females, like I said, so much so in, in fact that um, the sex of a tiger can be identified by its track. So looking at the average size of a tiger track footprint left behind, you can tell whether it was made by male or female. What's really interesting is their pattern of stripes is unique to each individual. So just like our fingerprints, um, researchers have been able to use photos from camera traps and videos to identify individual tigers in the wild. Um, they do have a little white spot on the back of their ears, which is believed to confuse um, prey and other predators, uh, thinking that they're actually facing in the opposite direction that they are facing. Um, and then most people are aware of the normal color variant, uh, which is that orange color, uh, but there are also other color variants that include white, golden, and snow white. Um, so you'll see here, one of our tigers here is a white tiger. Um, so she's white with black stripes. Golden tend to be white with brown stripes, and then snow white, the stripes are barely visible if they're at all. Now, these are all color variants that technically exist in the wild, but at a very extremely low rate, about one in 10,000. Um, the white coloration does not help camouflage, um, as well as the orange coloration, so usually cubs that are born white are picked off and don't survive. That um, coloration, it's not an albino, it's just caused by a recessive allele that's carried by the parents. Um, all right. Uh, and it's just, they lack the um, melanin pigments that create the orange color. Uh, we do see a lot more white tigers in captivity than we would in the wild, um, and that's just because they were overbred because of their coloration. And so there's um, a big, uptick among uh, zoologists and researchers and, and people who house these tigers in captivity to try and decrease the amount of breeding of white tigers. Um, unfortunately, because it's from a recessive allele and there's so few of them to begin with, the original line, genetic line of these white tigers is very inbred. And so it comes with a lot of health problems. Most white tigers have, um, at the very least, are cross-eyed. Some have um, cleft palate issues. Um, thankfully, our girl here is, is healthy. She's a little cross-eyed, but it doesn't stop her from acting like a normal tiger. Um, and we didn't specifically breed her for the white, for the white color. Um, her parents happened to just carry that gene. Um, so the two tigers that we have here in the picture are actually sisters. So um, both of their parents were the orange color. And obviously, both of them carried the white gene. All right. Um, in terms of comparing li lions and tigers, because they are very similar, um, lions tend to have a broader nasal opening on the skull, um, but their skulls look very similar, and the easiest way is to look at their bottom jaws. Um, while both of them have very big, impressive canines, tigers tend to have slightly larger and more curved canines. Um, as far as behavior, lions are social, so they live in groups called prides, and some males live in smaller groups called coalitions. Tigers tend to be very solitary. Um, lions are considered to be strong climbers, and like cats, most cats hate water. Tigers are kind of the exception to that rule. They love water and they're actually strong swimmers. Um, both are apex, apex predators, meaning they're at the top of the food chain, and both are mainly nocturnal. Um, something else, I just needed an excuse to include this really funny picture <laughs> that um, both lions and tigers, and there are a number of other animals that do this as well, uh, it's called the squemin response. Um, if you have cats at home, you've definitely seen them do this. Um, so it's a response when they smell something interesting. Usually it's males in response to a female being in heat, um, but really any interesting smell can produce this response. Um, and they're basically curling back their lip um, and as a way to draw more air into their J Jacobson's organ, which processes those scents. Um, so what's interesting is other animals that do this, horses do this a lot as well. Um, we see this in animals like giraffes, um, goats, rhinos do this, um, some antelope species as well. Um, but they always look very funny when they're doing it. So I had to include this picture in there. This is with Kaya. All right. Um, just a Quick tangent, um, because I thought it might come up. 
there are hybrids that exist. Um, these are not natural hybrids. They wouldn't exist in the wild. Um, but in theory, um, you can cross any of the big cats in the genus panther with each other. Um, and they're named by the male or the sire um, gets the first part of the name and then the female parent gets the second part of the name. So these are all the potential crosses that can occur. Um, the two most common are the Tigon, which is a male tiger and a female lion, and a liger, which is a male lion and a female tiger. Um, and so you can see um, the liger is typically bigger than either of the parents because it's believed that there is a growth inhibiting uh, gene that um, is in female lions. And so when you have the female tiger, that inhibitor gene is not there anymore. And so the offspring, that hybrid liger, is bigger than either the lion or the tiger parent. Um, tigons are, gen are more similar in size to their lion parent because it, it's coming from um, the, um, sorry, <laughs> but, yeah, the tigon are around the same size. Um, because they don't have the, the opposite, basically, the growth promoting gene there. Um, again, hybrids are kind of a controversial topic, uh, especially in the captive community. Um, there are most people um, prefer not to try and promote the breeding of them because they're not a natural species. Um, but then you do have those people that just like to see it, it, what you can get when you cross different animals together. Um, so definitely a controversial topic not one that we um, promote here at Southwick Zoo. Um, it's interesting in the sense from a genetic point of view and from an evolutionary point of view, um, but because these species don't exist in a while, there's really not a conservation um, reason behind it. So it, it's really hard to get behind in that sense. All right, getting back to our lions and tigers here. Um, in terms of habitat, so um, lions, there are actually two groups of lions, um, African lions, which most people are familiar with, and there are Asian lions as well, um, which are a little bit smaller. Um, so they're considered two different subspecies, uh, but as I mentioned, most of the lions you're familiar with would be those African lions there. Um, so they're coming from actually from this southern part of Africa here. And then the Asian lions are from North Africa and Asia. Uh, whoops, went backwards, sorry. Um, tigers, um, their populations have been greatly decreased. So since early 20th century, so early 1900s, tiger populations have decreased by about 93%. Um, we have a number of subspecies that have gone extinct in that time, unfortunately. Um, so tiger numbers are definitely in jeopardy in the wild. Um, there is a little bit debate about whether the subspecies you see here are actual subspecies or just regional groups. Um, it goes back and forth between geneticists and morphologists and taxonomists, so it depends who you talk to. Um, but you can definitely see slight differences in sizes and coat patterns and colorations um, to make the argument that they're subspecies. Um, and so you can see here um, there are six currently the six current subspecies and three that have gone extinct uh, recently, um, but they're found um, in India, um, Indonesia, Asia, and Russia. All right. Um, probably not surprising to most of you, but tigers and lions are carnivores, which means that all they eat is meat. So in the wild, they'd be hunting medium to large sized mammals. Um, here at the zoo, we give them mostly horse and cow meat, um, a lot of the times with the bones still in them, so they're getting chunks of animals like they would in the wild. Um, in the wild, you have to keep in mind that they're not going to be eating every day. Um, they're going to have to first go out and hunt for their food, expend a lot of energy to chase and bring down that food item and consume that. Um, so here at the zoo, we feed our lions and tigers every third day. Um, and that seems to be something that uh, that caretakers have, you know, researched and agreed upon best kind of mimics the amount of food that they'd be getting um, hunting in the wild so that they're not getting overfed here uh, in a human care situation. Um, we, they do eat about 30, 25 to 30 pounds per cat 
per meal. Um, so when they do have a meal, it's quite a lot and that does sustain them for the next few days until feeding time. Um, in the wild, when they take down those big animals, they can gorge themselves um, up to 60 pounds in one sitting. And again, that's because they might not know where their next meal is coming from. So they're gonna eat what's there in front of them while they have it. All right, so um, this video here shows the buckets of meat. Now, normally we feed their cats, uh, we feed the cats in their night houses um, so that we can separate them and there's no aggression or fighting over the food. Um, this was a special occasion uh, which we do every now and then where we fed them outside in their enclosure. Uh, so you saw the zookeepers placing the food. Um, the cats were safely locked inside when they were doing that. And uh, the zookeepers were safely back out of the enclosure before we let the cats back in. Um, so you can see LJ here and his powerful climbing to get to that piece of meat up top. Um, so we generally don't think of big cats like lions being able to climb, but they are extremely well adapted for that with their powerful muscles and strong claws. And so you can see he kind of grabs his meat and takes it down. Um, this is now our two tigers. <laughs> so you can see Kaya is our orange one and Taj is to the right there, uh, ran right over and claimed their meat. Um, Taj does get her own piece, so don't get too concerned that Kaya got that big pile. Um, but you can see, that was a roar and a warning to her sister to say, back up, this is my pile of meat, go find your own. Um, and that's normally, like I said, why um, we don't feed them on exhibit all the time. We feed them inside their house where we can separate them. Um, the other reason why we do that is so that we don't have them getting used to associating their enclosure with feeding time, because we wanna be able to bring them inside um, so that the keepers can go in and clean. Um, but if they're used to being fed outside, they really have no reason to come inside. And that's just Taj relaxing after a good meal. <laughs> All right. Um, so go through this a little bit quicker because I was just noticing the time here. It's really easy to talk on and on about these animals here. Um, we have a, a male and a female lion, LJ and Lavana. They are brother and sister. Uh, they were born in 2012, so they're about eight years old. Well, actually, they have a birthday coming up soon, um, so they'll be eight years old. Um, Lavana is fixed uh, just because they are brother and sister. We don't want any accidental inbreeding going on, um, and we chose to fix her because she's not representing any unique genetics um, that aren't already represented in captive populations, um, so there's no real need for her to be a breeder, um, and if we had fixed uh, our male, LJ, he wouldn't grow that nice mane that people come to expect to see. Um, our tigers, as I mentioned, are sisters, Kaya and Taj. They were born in 2007, so they'll be um, coming up on 13. Now, we can house them together because they are sisters. Um, as I mentioned, tigers are solitary, so generally when you see them in a zoo, they're going to be living by themselves, um, and that's because they really don't get along with other tigers. Uh, these girls are the exception because they were raised together. Um, in terms of husbandry, they're on exhibit the entire year. They do have access to a heated indoor area, but both the lions and the tigers love the snow. Um, they must be cleaned every day, which, as I mentioned, requires them to be locked inside so the keepers can go outside, and then vice versa. They need to be locked outside for a few moments so the zookeepers can clean their indoor area. Um, and we also um, really focus on that enrichment as well. So this is a video clip of our lions getting some rawhide enrichment and our zookeepers also rubbed a little catnip on it. So this was pre-COVID obviously with the, the crowd there. <laughs> this is July 2018. You can see they're very popular animals here. Um, and Lavana basically stole that, um, but LJ gets his piece. He doubles back and finds the other rawhide piece. And while this is playing, um, so while this is playing, I saw a question pop up um, that says the lions are often sleeping at the zoo. Is it because they don't eat very often? Oops, didn't mean to pause that. There we go. Um, 
Um, it's, it's not necessarily because they don't eat often. So just like our cats at home, and you'll see LJ is rubbing his um, scent glands all over that piece of rawhide making it his. Um, but just like our cats at home that like to sleep during the day, they're mainly active at night. Um, so when you come to the zoo, it's usually during the day because that's when people are awake. Um, but the cats are more content to sleep and rest during the day, especially when it's hotter. And then they're going to be up and more active at night. Um, so it's not really because they are um, hungry or it's because they haven't eaten. It's just because cats from the smallest domestic cats at home to the large tigers like to rest and nap during the middle of the day. Um, this was some enrichment. Uh, apologies for the, the quality, but it was from a phone video taken from the top of their enclosure looking down um, of our tigers. They have a nice big pool. And this was during this past summer. Um, the zookeepers froze some of the extra blood from their meat and created a blood sickle for them. Um, doesn't sound appetizing to us, but it's one of the tiger's favorite treats. And it encourages them to swim, um, have to get in the water and, and use those natural behaviors to get at that uh, treat. Um, as I mentioned, they love playing in the snow. Um, so they don't seem to know that they're more adapted for dry, hot climates of Africa. <laughs> um, they're New England lions for sure, so they adapt really well. As I mentioned, they have the option and the choice to go back inside where it's heated. So um, this is not them being forced to be out in the snow. This is them choosing to be out and playing in the snow. It's a little bit uh, more of a natural behavior for tigers to be out in the snow because they are found in those colder environments. Um, so you can see here, this is the end of, of a snowman that the, the keepers, the snow, big snowball that the keepers rolled for the cats. Um, that they are happy to play with in the snow. Uh, so it's always fun getting to watch them here in the winter. Um, unfortunately, we're not open to the public during the winter. Our, our pathways are a little bit unsafe for people to be walking around here in the zoo. Um, but we try and post these videos to keep people updated on what our animals do in the winter time. Um, and so um, talk about lion and tiger conservation. Um, so we obviously don't do encounters here like we do with the sloths. That would be a little bit too risky and dangerous. Um, but we do still support uh, conservation, um, specifically lion. We work with a, a conservation organization called the Niasa Carnivore Project, um, which helps lion conservation. Uh, they are considered vulnerable in the wild. Um, again, mostly due to habitat loss and human wildlife conflict. Um, so as human populations expand, we create more farms, more um, living areas. We encroach on these animals' environments. Um, we are looking into getting involved with um, some tiger conservation organizations as well. Uh, we, we just aren't partnered with one at the moment. And I did think I saw a chat pop up here. Um, and so other question about them is why do they usually fight? Um, so yeah, if you're at our zoo in particular, um, I mentioned that our two lions are brother and sister and our tigers are two sisters. So just like siblings of any animal species, including ourselves, they like to fight and wrestle and play with each other. Um, so that is completely normal behavior. They're not actually fighting, they're, they're playing, um, but it's really fun to watch. Okay, um, before I move on to rhinos, uh, any other questions about our cats here? All right, well, I'm gonna keep moving because I know we're getting towards the end of time here, but if any questions pop to mind, just drop them in that chat and we'll get to them there. All right, so last but not least, uh, we're gonna talk about our rhinos here. Um, so you can see that, uh, again, today is all about the big mammals. Oh, I saw a chat pop up right there. Do lions eat rhinos? Good question um, for the transition. So um, they are found in similar environments in Africa. Um, it would take a lot of work for a lion to take down a rhino. So um, if they're really desperate, they might go after a rhino cat, um, but they still have mama rhino there to protect and, and um, chase that rhino. So, 
rhinos are not usually a prey item of choice for the lions. Lions are, are gonna go after animals more like those gazelles and antelopes, maybe a zebra, things that are a little bit um, easier and not as heavy or as big to take down. But really good question. Um, so our rhinos here, uh, we have white rhinos and they are part of a group called perissodactyls, um, which is a fancy word that means odd-toed ungulates. And that means that they are um, bearing most of their weight on the third toe out of five toes. So they generally have um, one toe like a horse, three toes like our tapers or rhinos, and they're bearing weight on that middle toe. The closest living um, relatives to rhinos are horses and tapers. And that gave me a really good excuse to throw in this video of one of our baby tapers from a few years ago, just because they're so cute. I know we're talking about rhinos, um, but taper babies are spotted and striped. We call them little baby watermelons. Um, and so poor mom was just trying to get in a little nap and you can see baby taper was, had some other ideas in mind. Um, so they're always fun to watch. All right, um, so getting back to rhinos, though, they're just as cute. There are actually five species of rhinos. Um, so the smallest ones are the Sumatran rhino, then the Javan rhino. Um, we have greater one-horned rhino and black rhino are about similar in size, and then white rhinos are the largest. Um, black and white rhinos are the two African species. The other three are found in Asia and Indonesia. Unfortunately, as you can see here, all of them are endangered on some level. Um, and three of those rhinos on the left are critically endangered. So um, the Sumatran rhino and the Javan rhino, their numbers are down to less than 100 each. Um, so um, they are very um, much at risk of disappearing within our lifetimes, which is very sad. I just saw a question pop up that said the Javan and the greater one horn rhino have rough spots shown where are those. Good question um, and good eye. So you can see that those two rhinos tend to have a more armor looking um, feel to their skin. That's just part of their skin. They tend to be a little bit bumpier. Um, so just variation in skin coverings. And you'll see also along the, that note, the Sumatran rhino looks like it has fur. Uh, they're very much more furry compared to the other rhinos um, and are actually most closely related to their prehistoric relative called the woolly rhino. Just like woolly mammoths look like really furry elephants, the woolly rhino looks like a furry rhino um, and the Sumatrans resemble that uh, the most closely and they're the most closely related. So that kind of makes sense in that way. Um, so those greater one-horned and Javan rhinos just have thicker skin that tends to form those bumpy areas. Why are they endangered? Really good question. We're gonna come back to that a little bit towards the end when we talk about their conservation, um, but it has to do a lot with their horn, which we'll get to in a second. So hold on to that thought and we'll definitely address that question. Um, let's see here. All right, when it comes to naming the, white, the rhinos here, um, I said we have white rhinos, um, and that's if you, whoops, um, look back here, they're actually all depicted as gray. So all of the rhinos are kind of a grayish brown color. Um, so the white and black rhino is kind of a misnomer. It's not a very accurate name. We actually think the term white rhino came from a mistranslation of the word wide, which refers to their mouth. Um, so these guys are also known as square-lipped rhinos. They have very wide, flat mouths that allow them to graze on grass. Uh, which is what we're going to see them eating and a little bit further down. Um, so white is not really anything to do with their color, but really their mouth shape. Um, other features about them, they are very hefty animals. Um, females tend to be about 4,000 pounds, which is two tons, so quite heavy. Males can be up to three tons or 6,000 pounds. They are five to six feet tall at the shoulder, um, so about as tall as an average sized person. Um, and they can live 40 to 50 years, both in the wild and under human care. So long lived as well. Um, now, I mentioned one of the features we're gonna talk about are their horns, and this plays into their uh, conservation uh, related issues as well. Um, so a lot of rhinos are endangered because they're poached for these horns. Um, it's believed that these horns have medicinal properties. They can cure cancer, they can cure hangovers. Um, they can make you stronger. 
None of that has been proven scientifically. Um, and actually, we know that those horns are made of solid keratin. So keratin is a protein that's made, that makes up our fingernails and our hair. Chewing on our hair, chewing on our fingernails doesn't do anything for you medicinally, so their horn doesn't do anything either. Um, but these are very deep-rooted traditional beliefs, um, and so the best way to um, get that messaging out there um, about rhino horn is to decrease the demand for it by, um, you know, working with the communities where the rhinos are being poached or where the rhino horn is being sold to um, and kind of uh, creating an educational campaign to promote that we really don't need to be killing rhinos just for their horns. Now, um, a sad fact along with that is that you can actually safely harvest a rhino horn if you cut above the growth plate. So again, just like we can get our hair cut or we can trim our nails, it doesn't hurt us. However, if you rip your fingernail out at the bed of your finger, that is a different story. Um, so these horns can be harvested, but if you're a poacher trying to feed your family um, by selling that horn for money, you're gonna wanna get as much as you can as fast as possible. So they're not taking the time to safely cut these horns off. They're getting as much as they can, and unfortunately that ends up with a dead rhino on the other end of that. Um, if that horn is harvested safely, it takes about one to two years to grow back. Um, on average, the front horn of a rhino is about two feet long, but it can be up to five feet long. So it can be a formidable weapon. Um, usually females use that to protect their young and males will use it to spar with each other when finding a female. Um, this is a short video of one of our rhinos, Louise, rubbing her horns. So you'll notice that they keep them nice and smooth by rubbing them on logs, on branches, on rocks. Um, this is just something that helps keep that shape of the horn um, and keeps it nice and smooth. So natural behavior that we see there. Um, other uh, examples of their behavior or other parts of their behavior um, for being such big animals, um, they are actually very jumpy. And that's because they have pretty poor eyesight. They can only see about three to four feet in front of them at any given time. Um, to make up for that really poor vision, they have a great sense of smell. Um, their olfactory passages are actually larger than their entire brain. So all of that going on in the front of their big heads um, help to get, give them their great sense of smell. And they have really great hearing as well. Uh, they can rotate their ears 180 degrees independently. So you can have one ear facing forward and one ear facing backwards at the same time, kind of gives them built-in surround sound. Um, so despite not being able to see very well, they're very well adapted to know what's going on in their surroundings. Um, adult males are generally solitary. Uh, females of white rhinos live in groups of up to 14 animals. These groups are called crashes. Uh, which is a pretty apt name for them. Um, what's really interesting about rhino groups is that they create these middens or dung piles, um, and some of them can be over 10 feet long. Uh, and so that might sound a little gross to us, but it actually is very informative for the other rhinos in the area um, because it tells them that kind of territory is already taken and accounted for by community. Um, you can also um, learn a lot about the cycles of female rhinos from their urine and feces. You can tell if they're in estrus or ready to be bred. So those are all chemical cues and sensory cues that, that the rhinos use to communicate with each other. Um, and one of the favorite things that rhinos like to do, like Thelma here, is to take a nice mud wallow. Um, so that mud covering helps protect them from the sun and also from bugs. Um, so you can see here that we provide them with a nice muddy pit that they often take advantage of. Um, in terms of where you can find them, um, we're mostly talking about right, white rhinos, but I threw this up here to have black rhinos as well to show you that there is some overlap. Um, now it looks, uh, as you can see here, um, the current populations are very fragmented and that's because their numbers have decreased greatly. So even their historical range, the black rhino used to be much more plentiful across Africa. Um, you can see that the squares there are original populations and we've reintroduced them into a few other areas. Um, same for white rhinos, we've actually tried to introduce them into some areas of Western Africa um, to see if we can kind of start communities there just to increase numbers. 
Um, they are generally found in grassland and savanna habitats. Um, so they're definitely used to open drier areas. And that kind of works with their diet. So white rhinos are herbivores. They're strictly grazers. So they're just going to be eating grass. Um, most of the other rhino species are browsers. So they're still herbivores. They're still just eating plant material. But instead of eating grass, they're eating things that are slightly off the ground, like shrubs and berries and, and things of that nature. White rhinos are considered to be the, the lawn mowers of the animal kingdom um, because they just eat grass. In the wild, they can eat up to 50 pounds per day. Um, in on human care, they're not roaming around as much, so they certainly don't need as much food. Um, so here they get hay and grains, um, about a bale of hay and a half bucket of grain each every day. So they're still eating quite a bit. Um, now this one here has some sound, so you can see that they're very noisy eaters. So um, you can hear some kind of muffle, just grunting and low noises there. Um, they're not afraid to make sounds while they're eating and chewing. Um, they're grabbing that hay with those nice lips and then their teeth are very set back and they're flat molars. If you've ever seen horse teeth or you're familiar with horses, they look very similar to help grind down that hay and vegetation that they're eating. Um, we have two white rhinos here, Louise and Thelma. Um, they are not actually related, um, but they act very much like sisters. Most of the time they get along fine. They push each other around every now and then, especially over food. Um, but the easiest way to tell them apart is by looking at their ears. Um, Louise is on the left here. So she has slightly more hair around her ears and has three notches in her left ear. Thelma has two notches in her left ear. Um, and that's something that's very commonly done to hoofstock animals um, of all kinds to be able to quickly identify them. So that was done when they were calves. Um, they did come over here from a preserve in South Africa, but they were still at risk of being poached over there. So um, that particular preserve made an agreement with a number of facilities across the US um, in about 2012 and sent over, I believe it was about 20 rhinos that they sent over to different facilities here across the US. And, um, we were fortunate enough to receive Louise and Thelma. Now, when it comes to taking care of them, um, they are also on exhibit the entire year, like the cats. They also have access to an indoor area. Um, I don't have any videos of them in the snow, but they do like the snow. We just have to be careful about ice with them. We don't want our big two-ton animals slipping and falling on ice. Um, we Despite them being social, um, we do have to be careful because of their size. So we do only go in their enclosure when they're locked inside um, and vice versa. And then of course we provide them with enrichment as well. So um, this was a particular um, enrichment event we were doing for Rhino Day. So um, Rhino Day just passed actually. It's every year on September 22nd. Um, and it's a day that we can recognize all of the different rhino species and bring awareness to their uh, plight in the wild and conservation issues. So the keepers for this particular day last year in September decided to set up some logs um, that had some cologne sprayed on them and a big ball. Um, we were kind of hoping that they would push the ball into the logs like a bowling, bowling ball into pins, but as you can see here in just a moment, they went right over to the logs. Um, and started knocking them down. So <laughs> there goes the first one. Um, so it is a little tricky sometimes to come up with ways to, um, to keep our animals enriched. We have to be very creative, um, but new smells, new things to see, new items to play with um, in their case, because they do like rubbing their horn on things, um, giving them different textures and structures. Uh, those are all different things that we can offer the rhinos to make each day a little bit different and new for them and keep them kind of interested in their environment. Um, and you can see that they um, are getting a little bit excited here, kind of trotting a little bit. So despite their big size, they can actually run up to 35 miles an hour, uh, which is fairly quick for a two ton, three ton animal. Um, and they don't stop very well. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, I believe, where the myth of rhinos 
charging at you come from. Um, they can go pretty fast, but then it's hard to slow down. And remember, they don't see very well. So it's going to take them quite a while to slow down and stop. Um, and you can see the last kind of poles fell over and gave them a little bit of a scare there. Um, but they recovered from that nicely. Sadly, they never actually pushed their ball around this entire day. We were waiting for it and they just let it sit there. Um, but we were happy that they interacted with the bulls. So rhinos apparently don't like bowling, but they will knock things over on their own. All right, um, the last part of this, you know, we're getting close to the end here. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. I realize I'm over time a little bit, but I love talking about our animals here. Um, is conservation. So um, as I mentioned, rhinos are poached for their horns. So they are endangered, as you saw in that other um, graphic. And so this is from Save the Rhino International, um, the number of rhinos that have been poached since 2006. So you can see there was an increase, uh, a big increase in the 2010s, 2011, 2012. And then it started thankfully going down. And that's because in 2016, 2017, a um, number of organizations got together globally and really um, started cracking down on uh, enforcing fines and penalties for poaching, um, increasing community awareness and educational programs. And so we are headed in a good direction right now um, in terms of increasing numbers, but we have a long way to go and unfortunately it might be too late for some of those smaller populations. Um, so here at Southwick Zoo, uh, our, we contribute to rhino conservation. Um, by offering rhino encounters. Um, so we have an area at the back of their enclosure where there's these concrete poles, as you see in the picture there, where you get a chance to meet Thelma and Louise up close. And it's a fantastic experience. Um, we've done some surveys and research and shown that participants walk away with a greater connection to these animals, a greater inspiration to want to try and commit to conserving them and take action. Um, so they're, you know, there's the, the cool factor of just being able to say get to touch a rhino, but the um, educational and conservation related impacts are really important of these encounters as well. The money that we raise goes towards an organization in South Africa called Project Rhino. Um, Project Rhino itself is an association of different organizations, game reserves, uh, rangers, wardens, people who own rhinos, um, conservation organizations that have all these boots on the ground programs. So, they train anti-poaching patrols. Um, they work with the communities there. So it's a really a group effort. Um, and that's really the way that we're going to help these rhinos. Um, so a quick plug along those lines. We do have a virtual fundraising event coming up um, called Protect Not Poach. It's going to be on Saturday, October 24th from 10 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, it is going to be streamed worldwide, though, on Mofer TV and Facebook Live. So please, um, if you you want to learn more about the projects we're doing, you want to learn more about rhino conservation, we'll have our um, partners from Project Rhino tuning in and, and streaming in from South Africa as well. Um, it's a really uh, important event for us and we're hoping to raise a lot of money that we can send over there to help them with their conservation efforts. Um, so just the last few, couple few videos here. Um, this is what your view might be of a rhino encounter. So you can see they're very excited to come over and say hello. Um, and those are those poles. And so you do get to reach through and safely give them a nice scratch. Um, and then I'm going to wait until I stop talking to play this because this um, was a little video clip I got on my phone of Louise snoring. Um, so after an encounter, she decided to lay down and take a nap. And so it's really important for us for any of these types of encounters that the animals are comfortable. So it's set up so they have the option to move away at any point in time if they want to leave. Um, but this is a really good sign because it shows that she's so comfortable that she decided to take a nap right next to us um, on the other side of the poles. They're just out of the view of the camera. But it's really interesting to hear them snore. I'm going to play that one more time because it's a short video. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so fun fact about rhino noises is that a lot of the sound effects you hear in the Jurassic Park movies, um, the dinosaur no noises, are actually recordings of rhinos. Um, so not only are they dinosaur-like in their size and sound, um, apparently enough in their sounds that people thought they could use it for movie effects. That's kind of where the similarities end though, um, of course, because we know that rhinos are mammals and dinosaurs are reptiles. So they're not closely related at all, but they're both very big, fascinating animals. Um, and on that note, that's all I got for you today. Um, so thanks so much for listening. I see I'm going to pull up the chat here. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, any questions about the animals I talked about today, um, about our other animals, anything else about the zoo, I, I'll stay on for a few minutes um, to see if there are any questions. I agree, the tapers are cute. I can maybe talk about them next time. I had to throw that video in. <laughs> uh, while people think of questions that they might have, I noticed that on that chart, there was an increase in poaching around 2007, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, do you know by any chance what was the, the reason for that? Um, yeah, so there's a, a big increase in 2008 here, and then it dips down a little bit and increases. Um, I'm not sure of the exact cause of that increase. I do know around that time, um, sort of in the early 2000s, there was unfortunately a lot more um, information that came out proposing that rhino horn could actually cure things like cancer and, and hangovers. Um, so some top politicians of countries overseas came out and, and promoted the use of rhino horn. So it actually was a little bit of a setback in um, the fight against um, the information we're trying to put out there, which is that, you know, the horns are better left on the rhinos themselves. They really can't help humans in any way. Um, but that's pretty, honestly, it's pretty typical to see those bumps and waves um, when it comes to any wildlife trafficking. Um, it could be that a video came out about a cute animal or, um, you know, some propaganda comes out and sparks interest in that item or that animal again. Um, and then we kind of have to fight back against that information until we can get it back under control. Um, so unfortunately, it's a multi-pronged problem. Um, so there's not just one simple solution, pretty much like everything else going on um, today. So we have to kind of make it a global effort for it to work. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Oh, you're very welcome. Yes, I am definitely very passionate. Um, so thank you. I love seeing your passion. Um, I love working with animals, um, obviously, uh, or I wouldn't be here. And I, I love sharing information. That's even more important to me is kind of inspiring this love of animals and everyone else. All right. Thank you so much, Samantha. What a fantastic talk today about the sloths and the rhinos and the lions and the tigers. I learned so much. It, uh, unbelievable. Fascinating. So thank you so much for um, um, bringing this great talk to us today. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs>